I'm reading this morning from Ecclesiastes chapter 11, 1 to 6. Send your grain across the seas, and in time, profits will flow back to you. But divide your investments among many places, for you do not know what risks lie, might lie ahead. When clouds are heavy, the rains come down. Whether a tree falls north or south, it stays where it falls. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. Just as you cannot understand the path of the wind or the mystery of a tiny baby growing in its mother's womb, so you cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. Plant your seed in the morning and keep busy all afternoon, for you don't know if profit will come from one activity or another, or maybe both. Father, as we look at your word this morning, we, uh, we open our hearts to you, and uh, we invite you to speak to us. Amen. Uh, this morning for the scripture reading, Ernie read from Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses, the first six verses. The sermon's not on those, those uh, verses, but after, uh, remember, Ecclesiastes 11, 1 to 6. Remember those verses, go back and read them again. You might understand them differently than you did the first time through. But I want to start this morning with a story uh, and see what you think of it. The story is about a great big guy, 250 pounds, an engineer, but he got sick and he started wasting away. Eventually ended up in the hospital, but they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him and he, he, it got, got worse and worse, under 100 pounds. They couldn't figure out. Eventually the inevitable happened and he died. Uh, we're off to a cheery start, right? The doctor goes and explains to his wife that, the, that her husband's dead dead and she says it can't be i prayed for him for 27 years and god promised me that he was going to be saved and he's not saved he can't die why would god have me pray for him for 27 years promise me that he's going to save him and then he would die doesn't make sense he can't be dead the doctor says why well, I, I don't know anything about that but i know that he's dead pull the curtain around him. But the wife refuses to admit that he's dead. So if you're the hospital staff, what do you do? You throw her out when her husband just died? So this is where their strategy, they, they'd use reason. They'd convince her that he was dead. And they rounded up other doctors in the hospital, seven in all. And one by one, this took a period of time, but one by one, the doctors all looked at him and said, he's dead. They probably said it in a nicer way than that. <laughs> but he's dead. Well, she wouldn't, she said, well, he can't be dead, or if he is, God's going to raise him back to life because I've been praying for him for 27 years and he's God's promised. So if you're the hospital staff, what do you do? And what they decided to do is leave her some room to pray. She knelt there beside her husband, and she prayed. And the hours passed, one, two, three hours. She kept praying, seven, eight, nine hours. She kept praying, 10, 11, 12. After 13 hours, he all of a sudden opened his eyes, sat up, and said, I want to go home. And the doctor said, you can't go to home, you're too sick. And the wife said, you've had your chance, you called him dead. He's going home. And he went home and a short time after that went back to work. What do you make of a story like that? Be honest, what do you think? Ah, it's kind of tough, right? Ooh. Now, my problem, here's my problem. It's who tells the story is my problem. You see, I read it in a book that was written a long time ago, before I was even born, written in 1942, written by a guy named John R. Rice. 
Now, I know for most of you that name doesn't mean anything. But he was a popular writer back then, highly respected in the evangelical church. Not some wingnut, but a scholar. And he's telling the story of talking to Dr. Charles Blanchard, who was the second president of Wheaton College. His dad was the first president. Also a highly prominent evangelical, not some whack job. And Blanchard said, I talked to this guy after the fact, after he was back to work. That'd be like today, Chuck Swindle saying, I talked when Billy Graham was alive. I talked to Billy Graham. Billy Graham talked to this guy. It was, they were also their contemporaries. And you could go back to the hospital in Philadelphia and find the doctors. Rice and Blanchard had no problem believing that this actually happened. Uh, this is how, how Rice sums it up. He says, if such a miracle is rare, then it is equally rare that a woman would pray like that and believe God. Now I was thinking to myself, you know, if, I, if it was my spouse... And the doctor is saying my wife was dead. How long would I pray? <laughs> I'm thinking like 10 minutes. <laughs> ah, yeah, she's getting cold. <laughs> like seriously, how long would you pray? Ah, you get seven doctors saying, nah. I think I'm packing it in. He said, if such a miracle is, is rare, is equally rare that a woman would pray like that and believe God. I think this story is telling me about being a person of prayer, a person of faith, a person who's, who shows desperation in prayer. People ask me, what are you going to do when you retire? And my, you know, I, my answer is, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. But I can tell you one of my hopes. My hope is to be a person who dreams dreams. A person who believes God. A person of faith who could come along and encourage other people to believe that God wants to do something in their lives. I want to be a person of faith that dreams and allows other people to dream about what God is going to do in their life. Now today I want to talk to you about the kind of life that pleases God. And we're going to look briefly at a parable Jesus told in Matthew 25, starting with verse 14. And I invite you to consider what this parable might mean in your life. What are the implications are of this parable for you? And I'm going to suggest to you where we're headed. I suggest to you that the Bible teaches that a life that pleases God is not a safe life. It's not a life where we always play it safe. It's an unsafe life that pleases God, a life of faith. And then listen to this next part. Because we are human means we're going to make mistakes. It means at times we're going to step out in the wrong direction. It means that our friends might look at us and say, Oh dear, oh dear. I suggest to you that in church circles, we are often so afraid of making mistakes, of doing the wrong thing, that it hinders us from pleasing God. We're so afraid of disobeying God that we have failed to obey Him with passion and zeal. It hinders us from following hard after God because we're afraid to, to go, that we're going to go down the wrong path. We're afraid to hard, follow hard after anything. We're not sold out completely to anything. The greatest heroes in the Bible, from my perspective, lived reckless lives. They boldly stepped out in faith to obey God, but that same boldness that enabled them to step out in faith allowed them to step out at times in the wrong direction. They boldly obeyed, and as Martin Luther says, they also boldly sinned. 
And that passion that caused them to step out either in the right direction, most often in the right direction, but once in a while in the wrong direction, it was that passion that was appealing to God. I don't believe God is, is, is pleased with passionless living. Even if we never do anything wrong, let me say that again, if we, even if we never do anything wrong, God is not pleased if we are without passion. We just never do anything. I don't think that pleases him. He would rather that we be hot or cold rather than lukewarm. I remember when I was in Bible college, one of my professors said in their church they elected their deacons because they hadn't done anything. They were the kind of people who were nice and kind, but they'd never stood up for anything. They'd never made anybody mad. He said, we elect them not because of what they've done, but because they haven't done anything. And I suggest to you that that's not what God is looking for. It doesn't matter if it's the Old Testament or New Testament. The heroes of the faith were men and women who didn't live safe lives. Now let's look at Matthew 25, starting with verse 14. The NIV calls this the, the parable of the bags of gold. Originally, it's, uh, in this Greek, it's uh, the, the parable of the talents. A talent was a, a unit of measure, a measurement of weight where they weighed the gold or the silver. And so, verse 14, again, it, Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven. So again, the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, or five talents, to another two bags, to another one bag, each according to his ability, and then he went on his journey. Note, different servants receive different amounts. Based upon their abilities, their skills, they each received what they could handle, but they are each expected to do something with the master's money. Uh, the results matter. It is important what they did with what they were given. Each one, no matter what he was given, was expected to use it for the benefit of the master. Now, as we apply this uh, parable to ourselves, who's the man that goes on the journey? Who's that? Somebody said God, or we agree? That's God. God's the man going on the journey. Who are the servants? That's us, right? What are the bags of gold? The gifts, the abilities we have. I basically say it's our lives. The situations into which we are born, the opportunities that come our way, the gifts, the talents, the privilege the finances, everything basically that God gives us. Verse 16. The man who received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. Now, if you were to describe these two fellows, what words would you use? This is an interactive sermon. So what words would you use to describe these two guys? I can't hear anything. Ambitious. They're ambitious. What else? One at a time. Industrial. Ambitious, industrial. Okay, what does it take to invest five bags of gold and get five more? If you said to your fi a financial advisor, uh, okay, I, I should just give a little bit of background. It looks like this master's gone for a long time. But these two guys set out really quickly, invest the money, and in short order, get, uh, double the money. Now, if you go to your financial advisor and you say, I got $50,000 and I want to invest it, and in six months I want that to be $100,000. What's your financial advisor going to say to you about that investment? He's going to laugh in your face? Well, okay, this is, this is high time risk. It's a good investment if it actually turns out, right? It's a good investment, but it's high risk. What these guys are doing involves risk. 
If you put your money to work, you run the risk of losing it. You're wasting it. What if the investment goes bad, not because of something they've done, but because it just does, and they lost it all? Would the master be happy? Probably not, as we're going to see the results matter to him. So we need wisdom. They need wisdom in how and where to invest. But nonetheless, they're running a risk. They didn't just simply passively sit by. They put the money to work. The life that pleases God is an unsafe life. It's a life of faith. Let's keep reading. Verse 18. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, what words were you used to describe this guy? He's safe. He's fearful. I mean, mumble, mumble. I, I, my, my hearing ain't that good, so you got to holler. He's lazy. You've read the parable, maybe. <laughs> I, I'd say he's cautious. He's fearful. He's reluctant. Okay, let's turn the page. Keep reading. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold, so I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, remember the words that we used to describe these guys? Industrious courageous or risk takers uh, I don't know what else we do but the master uses different words than the ones we used he uses he calls them first of all good and I looked this up but is in the New Testament it's, it's very often used as good as opposed to evil as composed as as compared to wicked and so they're good like righteous, they're not evil. And secondly, they're faithful, full of faith. Uh, they've shown faith or faithfulness. Interesting words that the master chooses to use, not the ones we used. He calls them good and faithful. What is it about these men that, would have, that the master would imply that they are good not wicked, that they are righteous and not wicked. Let's keep reading. The, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. How much of it did he give back? He gave all of it back. Remember that. He gave 100% of it back. He didn't steal any of it. He didn't go use it on wild living or anything. He buried it, but he gave it all back. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them and throw this worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now what words did we use to describe this guy? Fearful, cautious, reluctant. 
We didn't use the words evil and wicked. But the master calls them three things. He calls them lazy, wicked, and worthless. A little harsher than what we use, right? <laughs> Actually a lot harsher. The man was playing it safe, but he gave back everything the master gave him. And for that he's called lazy, wicked, and worthless. What does that tell us about God? It tells us that a safe life doesn't please God. And yet we all tend to want to live a safe life. Now of these three things, lazy, wicked, worthless, which one bothers you the most? <laughs> I'm with the people who are saying wicked. The idea that he's called wicked. What did he do that made him wicked? Sure, he, he hid the money. He was afraid. But, but he returned it all. He didn't use it for wild living or something. What, is he, what did he do that made him wicked? The other two guys invested their money, doubled it, and they're called good. What makes them good or pleasing to God, and this guy wicked or displeasing to God? Now, let me shift gears and come at this from a different direction. Have you ever said to somebody, just trust me in this? You know, just, just trust me. I, I, I've got you. Just, just trust me in this. You ever said that to somebody? And you don't ever say that? <laughs> yeah, you said that to somebody? Yes, okay. When do you say that? When you're confident, okay. <laughs> when you're pretty sure you're not going to screw it up. <laughs> when else do you say that? I think we say it when the person's afraid. When the person's having a hard time believing that they can trust you. And thirdly, when there's risk involved, or at least when the person thinks there's risk involved. As I understand the Bible, basically God is saying to us all the time, trust me. Trust me in this. I got you. Don't sweat it. Trust me in this. That's what life is about. God saying to us, trust me. I'll take a, take a risk that I direct you to and trust me in this. Now, let me ask you a second question. How do we become righteous? What is the process by which we become righteous? The process is in believing God, in trusting Him. He says, trust me in this, and we trust Him, and by doing that, we become righteous. Uh, Paul talks about Abraham. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. Abraham believed God. The, what, what Abraham is believing God about is Abraham had no kids and God comes to him and says, I'm going to give you descendants as many as the stars are in the skies. And Abraham believes that promise. Abraham believed God and it was credited him as righteousness. It's a life of risk, of faith, that pleases God. In fact, when we live a life of faith, we become good and faithful servants. When we don't live a life of faith, we become wicked, lazy, worthless servants. The servant in the parable is wicked because he wasn't living by faith. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. But my righteous one, this is a quote from Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. Okay, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. The third fellow in this parable did exactly that. He shrunk back. He shrinks back. He's afraid he's going to lose his master's money. So in doing so, he wasn't living by faith, and therefore he's not righteous. He becomes wicked. Go down to Hebrews 11, verse 6. 
And without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must first believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. To live a safe life that doesn't require faith, where we never step out, never take a chance, never take a risk, never pray a prayer that demands great faith. To live that way, to require no faith, that the way we, when we live, we, it doesn't require any faith on our part, doesn't please God. The life that God expects us to live is a life that requires us to exercise faith on a regular basis, not just believing God for our salvation, but living dependently upon him day after day. A life that pleases God is an unsafe life. It's a life where we take chances, chances that we might be wrong and heading in the wrong direction. Now back to the parable. For that third servant, what do you think is worse for him? To do nothing like he did and put the, the money in the ground or to invest it and lose it? What do you think is worse? I submit to you that it is worse for him to do exactly what he did, to uh, dig a hole in the ground and put it in the ground. What's the result? Three results for him. First, he lost it all. It's taken away from him and given to the guy who has ten bags of gold. Secondly, he loses his relationship with the master. And third, he loses his salvation. He's thrown into outer darkness. I don't think, that if, if, I don't think it could get any worse for him. If he invested it and lost it all, it wouldn't be worse than those three. Maybe the master would give him credit for at least trying. The life that pleases God is an unsafe life. My guess is this isn't a real popular sermon at this point. Uh, I think we tend to play it safe. Particular, look at our focus. We're a spirit-led people who are fearless. That's what we want to be. We tend to play it safe, particularly when it comes to things about the Holy Spirit, and we miss out on what God wants to do for us. We want a life of safety rather than a life of risk, a life of faith. The point is this. Today I'm calling you to set aside your fear and step out in faith to do what you know God's calling you to do. I wouldn't be surprised at all that some of us, maybe lots of us here today, have a pretty clear sense of what God's calling, uh, calling us to do. But maybe we've been a little bit afraid to step out and do it. What if we're wrong? What if we're heading in the wrong direction? What if we're making a horrible mistake? What if we're screwing up our lives? We felt the tug of God on our hearts, but we've chosen to play it safe. Maybe someone here needs to quit their job and move away, move to do some mission or some ministry. Maybe some of us here need to give up a comfortable retirement to follow God somewhere where we never thought he would take us. Maybe it involves talking to our neighbors about what God is doing in our lives. Maybe the risk we need to take is to step forward and say, I'm going to get baptized. Here's an interesting one. Maybe the risk we need to take is to feel our anger or our fear or our anxiety or our jealousness or whatever it is, to really feel it so we know where it is that God really wants to transform our hearts and change us. My guess is that for many of us, it's praying something like this, God, I want you to do a new thing in my life and I give you access. I give you complete access to my life. And I invite you to do new and powerful things in me. For some, the risky thing is a new surrender to God's Spirit, where the Holy Spirit does a powerful thing in us. My sense is 
many of us may well have an idea of what exactly it is that God is calling us to. What God is challenging us to do. And so in conclusion as we pray, why don't we just say yes to God in our hearts. Yes, God. Yes, God, I'm going to step out. I'm going to live by faith on this one. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this story. I thank you that we can trust you. You invite us to trust you. Just trust me in this, you say. And we say, yes, we want to trust you. We give you permission. We give you access to our lives. We invite you to work in us. And we want to step out and say, yes, Lord, we will follow you. We will take that risk. We will believe you. We will follow you. Give us courage. Give us boldness. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.